Okay, this is one of my bigger projects. It uh, involves making a box to hold the game pieces for two different games. One is called Goblets and the other one is called Tic Tac Check. Uh, both of these games are available commercially, uh, but we make it here. We make all of our own pieces and we, just, we make everything. So, um, helps save a little bit of money because if you were to buy both of these games, you'd probably spend around $45 to buy them commercially. So, the first game I'd like to show you is Goblets, which involves these pieces here. There is actually more inside. There's four different sizes, and they can gobble each other up, hence the name Goblets. The object of this game is to get four in a row of your color. So, the guy would go there, go there, and come here. Now, because this one's bigger, he could cover that one up or we could bring another one up. You can't bring another big one straight off the table and put it on the board on top of somebody else's man. That's not a good move. You have to use one of the ones that are already up here. There's only one um, exception to that rule and that is if the uh, person with the gold pieces had three in a row or three in the same row and so let's say the next move would be to win and that's the only case where you could bring one up from the table and put it directly on one of their pieces. Otherwise you have to go to an empty spot or on top of one of your own guys um, or you can use one that's already on and cover them up. Okay. And eventually you get to the point where you know somebody gets four in a row and they win. Very simple game, but there is quite a bit of strategy. One of the things is you, you can't peek uh, to see if you've covered a guy up, so you have to remember and have a good memory for this game as well. So, it's quite a bit of fun. The other game, not as popular, but it's still fun. It's called Tic Tac Check. It involves using the chess pieces. You only need four for each side, a pawn, a knight, a bishop, and a rook. No king or queen. Basically, it's just kind of a simple game to teach people about the moves that the uh, chess uh, men make. And again, four in a row wins, and you take your turn putting your guys on the board. They can go anywhere, and uh, you can kill their guy using chess moves and then they have to take that piece off but then they could put it right back on anywhere else as their next move. So killing the other guy doesn't necessarily always mean that you're winning it just means that you might want that spot so don't just kill people for the heck of it um, so eventually you get to the point where somebody will have four in a row so those are the two different games that you can play with a 4x4 four by bo four by four, uh, checkerboard there. And well, it's, it's a fun game, but I personally like goblets better. This particular board was made with birch for the main part. Then the uh, different colors up here, we have aspen and red heart both of which I probably won't use ever again because uh, the red heart bleeds a lot like when you're sanding the red color you know, transfers over to the white and it's kind of hard to avoid that and the aspen is a little bit soft so um, I w if I were to do this over again I'd use birch for the white squares that way it kind of has more unity within the project and as you can see it opens up to store all of your pieces. What I'm going to do, I, I'm going to show making this from beginning to end. Uh, it's going to be another long video, but you know, it helps to show all the little tips and tricks so other people can do this. I'm going to use lace wood and birch. 
I know the lace wood doesn't look very pretty, but you'll see as we go along that that's actually a really nice looking piece of wood. And then birch will be my white part and the main part. I let the students choose between birch and oak, and then I have a uh, lot of different types of the darker colors. Um, I'll use Paduk. Um, Bloodwood would be better than uh, Red Heart because Bloodwood doesn't uh, bleed as bad. Then we have Purple Heart. You could do um, Walnut, Wamara. There's all sorts of you know, dark woods. I try to match the hardness. If uh, you know you're using birch, birch is pretty hard, so pick another type of wood that's fairly hard as well and that way you won't have sanding problems later. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. All right. For those who like the real quick explanation, the checkerboard, you don't just cut them into squares. What we do is we cut one and a half inch strips, glue them together, then plane it down so it's nice and flat. Then we take this one and cut it into strips like this. And then all you have to do is alternate the strips to create the checkerboard pattern. So I'm going to show you that in more detail now. Okay, I found that two feet is the uh, perfect amount of wood to make enough uh, checkerboard tops for three students. So I'll have them work in groups of three. Now I'm going to use the jointer and I'll just clean up one side of each of these. Next I'm going to cut these into one and a half inch strips. Um, actually I'm going to make them a little bit bigger than that and then I'll plane them down to the perfect dimension. That way they're all exactly the same because sometimes the table saw isn't perfect. So now I have two of each color. Now the lace wood is quite a bit thicker than the birch, but that's okay. I'll just go ahead and glue them together anyway. And then after the glue dries, then I'll plane them down to match. But before I glue them together, I need to plane them down this way so that they're exactly one and a half inches thick. And so I'm just going to double check real quick. And it's at uh, 1.57. So I'm going to plane it down on one side to uh, 1.54, and then I'll flip them over and do 150. You can see right here what I'm trying to get rid of is all these saw marks. Okay, now it's time for gluing and use some bar clamps, three of them. If you have longer pieces, let's say you're doing this for you know, four or five students, then you might need a couple more uh, for longer boards. Make sure any defects are on one side um, or if you find anything on, wrong on the edge, put it on the outside edge. Uh, you have two that you can work with there because uh, those are places that you could sand and fix it and this right here we won't be using the last 
about four inches of this board. So kind of work around any defects. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flip them all on the end like that and we'll put a bunch of glue on here. So you see there's a defect here, so I'm going to put that on the outside. So when it flips down, it'll be there. And don't be shy with the glue. I don't have a roller, so I'll just use my finger. And it seems to work just fine. Make sure the glue gets everywhere. Yeah. Wood glue will wash off with water. It's water soluble while it's still wet. So it's not going to hurt you. Okay, so I'll just flip all the, these down this way. Bring them in. And these, all you have to do is just push. And then the rest is turning these in. Make sure you're pushing down on these so they're all at least flat on the bottom. The, sometimes these ones are a lot thicker, but we'll plane them down to match later. So I'll just keep twisting that. You should start to see glue oozing out everywhere. Tighten that down. And the last one. Push down on it as we turn. Fairly tight. You want to leave it in the clamps for a while. Probably till the next day we can take them out in the next period and continue on. Okay, the board is all glued together. Now I'm going to plane it down. Just want to make sure how thick it is before I start. And 1.1, so I'll just start at about one inch and work my way down until everything is even. next step is to cut it into strips this way. Uh, it's very important that we cut these strips and these strips exactly the same so that everything goes together and with perfect squares. Um, this next setup is probably the hardest one but um, I just wanted to point out the, uh, the look of lace wood here. It's really really cool how it has almost this kind of a leopard spots effect to it. Some are small and some are big depending on where you are in the wood. Okay, I'm going to use the miter saw for cutting these. What you want to do is get some clamps, clamp a piece of wood to create a stop block so that uh, you can bring in the piece of wood and have it cut the exact same amount every time. The problem with using a stop block is if you can't clamp down the piece of wood that you're that you're removing, then the saw blade, as soon as it finishes cut, cutting through, the saw blade will catch the loose piece of wood here and uh, kind of trap it between those two, the blade and the uh, stop block. And I've seen chunks of wood just go flying. So you don't want to have it get pinched between the blade and the stop block. The way to avoid that is to use a spacer. So I'm just going to use a nice round piece of aluminum. That way no matter how I put it in, it'll be the uh, same amount every time. Um, so 
I place the stop block a little bit further over the same amount as the, uh, the diameter of the rod to create my one and a half inch strips. What I'll do is I'll make a couple cuts on some scrap wood and make sure it's perfect. If I need to make some adjustments then I'll do so and as soon as it's perfect then I will cut the others. So I clamped it down. I'm going to remove this. If you forget to remove this then you're just going to have that problem again of the wood being caught and just thrown. So we'll go ahead and cut that and see what happens. And you see that because there's a space there, the, the, the cut off piece of wood had enough room to scoot over and away from the blade so it wouldn't get pinched and tossed. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is trim off the edge of the board to make sure everything's even. You don't want to waste too much wood here. Alright, there we go, just a little bit uh, left over. Bring it till it hits the stick, but don't bang it super hard because you can then move the stop block. So just bring it up till it it contacts the spacer. Tighten this down. Don't go too tight because you can actually break the back of this. So that's actually already been done once. So don't he-man it to death. Alright. So we'll just make a cut. Always double check it, especially if it's the first one you're doing. And that's right at one and a half. All right, now we need to inspect the wood. If you see any bad spots, we'll put that on the outside. So I'm going to put that on the outside. Also check for any splinters and stuff. Put any anything that's bad down or to the outside. So I'm going to do that. This one. That side down, and we're going to alternate these so that it creates the checkerboard pattern. We'll put that on the outside. Okay, I'm going to put it in a vise, so I'm going to turn it so it's everything's being pushed together this way. All right, so I'll just move this over. Open this up all the way. Okay, we'll just let everything sit down on the vise. All right, the most important thing is to look at the corners on the inside. These, this center, and then these ones right here. Don't worry about the outside edges because we can sand that down to make everything flush on the sides. Okay, so as long as we make the inside perfect, then we can sand the outside till it's perfect. And that'll make everything work just right. Okay, so make sure that's going to go together good. If you notice any problems, then we can, you know, rearrange things a little bit. But this looks like it'll work out perfectly. So now it's time for gluing, just like we did in the bar clamps. So I'm going to flip this one up, this one up, and this one up. We'll leave that one alone. And we'll put the glue on. Okay, now I'm going to bring everything back down. Make sure everything lines up perfectly. especially the corners.
and then start clamping it together. Now sometimes as it clamps together things move a little bit so keep adjusting it as necessary as we bring everything together. So there's a little bit of a gap here. I'm going to keep squeezing the vise until glue oozes out everywhere. Keep checking all the connecting parts. Just do the best you can to make it all line up. And also keep pressure down to make sure everything's flush. We'll send it through a sander later to even everything out, even it all out, so it doesn't have to be perfect, but the closer it is to perfect, the less you have to do to fix it. Alright, so then I, I would put a piece of tape with a name on it, because there's going to be a lot of these gluing at the same time, and they can get misplaced, so make sure names are on everything. All right, so gluing is done. We'll have to sand this down later. I'll be using a surface sander because you want to be able to sand it perfectly flat to be able to glue it onto the top of the box. If you hand sand it, it might get slightly rounded. So you want to try to keep it as flat as possible, at least on the side that's going to be glued. The other side you can can sand it more by hand and, and it can be a little bit more rounded. but the one that gets glued down needs to be perfectly flat. So that's where surface sander comes into play. Um, right now I'm going to start working on the rest of the box. I'm going to do the walls first. Okay. All I do is just a, a rabbit joint here. It's kind of hard to see. All right, so it cuts in and over like that. And see the joint right there so that's a rabbit joint basically I just cut a groove in half the width of that piece of wood so we need two pieces of wood that are basically the exact same length as the top so we can just use the top and place it on the board and make marks and that should give us the perfect amount of wood you want to, to cut it slightly oversized and then we'll sand it down to match the top. We don't want, we want to do as little uh, removing from the sides of the play area as possible because if, if we made the box too small and had to sand this down then all the squares on the outside would be smaller than the squares on the inside and it wouldn't work as well. So we're going to make the box slightly bigger and sand that down to match. Alright, so I went ahead and trimmed off the edge there to make sure it's square. I'm going to line that up so they're even. If anything, make it slightly bigger. So just draw a line right here. When I, when I cut that, I'm going to make sure that I cut on this side of the line and make sure that I can still see the line after I've made the cut. That way it'll be just a little bit bigger. Okay, so as you can see, all lined up there with the grain, and these are slightly bigger than the top. That way we have a little bit we can sand down later. For the shorter piece, as you can see, it's going to be shorter than the top. And to figure out how long that needs to be, um, you got to think about what you're going to be doing for the rabbit joint here. When I set it up, I set it up so I cut off exactly half of the thickness here. So basically, this piece of wood is going to be the, the thickness of this one shorter because I remove half of it here 
and half of it here. So that equals a whole thickness. All right, so all I have to do is bring in the board that I'm going to be cutting. I will stack it on top of one of the boards that I just cut. Now this time I'm going to put this board sideways like this and then make sure that the end grain is going sideways instead of up and down because this is now this way just in case you didn't cut everything perfectly square. All right, then we'll make a line going across. Okay, now again I'll make another cut. Make sure you're cutting it slightly oversized and then everything will be ready to go. Okay, so I cut two pieces of wood that size. So now I have the two that are the same or actually slightly bigger going with the grain and against the grain. So grain going this way. The other ones are shorter, but if you were to take another piece, stack it up on top of it, remember we subtracted the, the width of the wood. Now it's the same size, or actually just barely taller than that. Just make sure when you're doing those things that you do the longer one with the grain and the shorter one against the grain. Next step is going to be routering the, the rabbit joint and the longer ones. So make sure you only do it on the long ones. And so we'll just do that on both sides and I'll make sure um, that the router is set up perfectly. I'll router a, a scrap piece of wood and measure it to make sure it's going down half of whatever this is and this is 60 so we'll make sure the router is only taking off 30. Okay, This is my router setup as this piece of wood. I cut out this section to allow the clearance for the uh, protector here. This is to keep fingers from getting in there. Um, this the miter gauge to uh, keep everything perfectly in there. So the most important thing is to keep pressure forward so that it cuts as deep as it's supposed to come this way and also to keep pressure down because sometimes uh, the wood can lift up a little bit. So keep pressure down and keep it pushed forward as we come across this way. Also uh, having a board right here helps prevent blowout as well as the router exits the wood. Now it's time to glue it together. Um, make sure that everything looks good. Uh, if you see any uh, problems with the routering job that you did, just do it again and you can fix any problems. Okay, so to glue it, I'll just come in here really quick. And I'll just use my finger and get that glue everywhere. Put it together by hand and then move it to a clamp. Okay, I'll drop it down in the clamp here. I'll bring it up a little bit. Now, sometimes when I have a lot of students working on this project at the same time, there's not enough vices to hold it together while the glue is drying the entire time. So, a little trick I have is have these. Uh, basically it's inner tube, uh, you know, car inner tube just cut into strips and just put that on there like that, flip it around, 
another one on the other side. It's good to stretch it out, then pull down, let it out, and then come in again. And now it has these clamps on it. So the student can then just stick it in a locker and the glue can dry there. Now notice there's still some gaps here, but we can just close those up and it'll hold it in place. So make sure everything's closed up. Get a square and check how square it is. And uh, also you can even put your top on there and make sure everything is going to work out just fine. Another thing you can do is just put it down in like this. Clamp it tight and then turn it the other way and clamp it tight. That'll close up all the gaps. And then when you take it out, the, the rubber bands will hold it in place. You can see all the glue oozing out and that lets me know that everything's nice and tight. Okay, I've let the glue dry for a little bit. Um, but I'm going to leave these on here just to keep pressure on it. Where the joints are, the wood isn't exactly the same height, so um, we're going to have to sand this down. Now if you have a surface sander that can handle something this small, you can use that. Or if a belt sander is wide enough, you could use that. But uh, just a big sheet of sandpaper on a nice flat board is probably one of the easiest ways to do this. Just to make it all flat. So just put even pressure down and just move it back and forth. And you'll just do that until everything is everything is flush all the way around. Okay, this is my surface sander. If you look inside, um, if you have a sander, a drum sander would work too, but um, you got to make sure that the rollers that hold down your piece while it's going through are close enough together that at least one of them will be on your project at all times. So as it comes through, that one will take over as soon as that one lets go. If you send anything through this machine that's narrower than the gap between these two, the, the part will get stuck in here and just get eaten up by the machine. So make sure your machine can fit this before you send it through. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it through at a diagonal so I'll have even a longer piece to make sure those rollers hold it down and it doesn't get tossed about inside there. Um, just take small, small bits off at a time and just go until everything's flat. Right, this should be, at least in my, in my classroom, this should be a three-man job. One person checking the tracking of the belt, making sure the belt isn't uh, coming off the track. Another person feeding in the tops, and the other one taking them out and handing them back. So that way you aren't running all over the place like I'm going to be. Another thing is, is, as it's feeding into the machine, push down on it to make sure that the uh, conveyor belt here can grab onto it and pull it through the machine. So keep pressure on it as long as you can until it gets in there and the, and the roller takes over for pressure. So everything is perfectly flat now. Depending on how far off these are, you might need to go more or less. There's actually a little bit of an, some little bit of glue left here, so I'll probably run it through it one more time. Okay, now it's time to glue this on. You want to look at both sides. Pick the side that looks the best, and that'll be the side that stays up. So we'll just look at this here really quick. You can see 
that uh, did a pretty good job on getting all these corners to match up except for this one right here it's a little bit off uh, that's not too bad so we'll just glue this on really quick Put plenty of glue on there. Make sure I spread it out. Yeah, I'll just drop it in before I do that. Make sure again, end grain goes the right direction. So I have my end grain here, here, and here. Grain is going this way, end grain is here. That's the side. I'll put it on there. And this is the tricky part. You got to get it centered on there. And when you're clamping things with a lot of glue, as you clamp down, everything likes to slide a little bit. So make sure as you're applying the pressure that everything stays exactly where you want it to be. And you want the same amount of excess of the box to be hooking up all the way around so you can sand those off evenly and everything will work out. So we'll put it in like this, bring the clamp in, I don't have it tight yet, I'm just looking at it to make sure everything's lined up. Once everything is lined up and I can feel excess wood all the way around, then I'll tighten it up the rest of the way. And then, just to make sure I have pressure everywhere, I'll add a parallel clamp on here as well. I'll just bring this in here. Clamp it. So I'm putting just a little bit more force on there. And you want to see glue oozing out all the way around. Okay, now that everything is glued together, I need to sand off all the excess. Okay, so I'm just going to put it on the belt sander and bring it in like this. Now you got to be careful as you're rotating it, don't have it be in contact because the uh, the belt can grab that corner and just throw it down and as it's throwing it down it'll get caught in the miter groove there and get caught then the sanding belt will break and snap and it's just a big mess so just be, make sure you're going straight in and straight out Keep checking it as you go. Make sure you don't take off too much of the top. Just want to get till it's flush. And I got a, another piece of birch here. Made sure that it's a little bit wider than my box. And line up end grain. So grain, end grain. And I want to cut this piece just slightly larger so I'm going to make sure I have a little bit extra there and I can draw my line here and when I make my cut it'll be just slightly bigger then we can glue it on and not have to be perfect then we can later uh, sand off the excess. Alright so I'm just going to glue the bottom on the same way that I did the top just put a bunch of glue on there and put it on there. I'm going to get sick of me telling you this but make sure that all the end grain matches up. Then you'll have a nice square of end grain all the way around. And 
device, make sure you have a little bit of extra going all the way, all the way around the bottom. So we got extra on the bottom, extra on the top, extra on both sides. Tighten it up the rest of the way. And again, put a clamp on there. I like to bring in the inner jaw first and then bring the other one in like this to make it nice and tight. So I'm opening up the back to close the front. Again, make sure glue is oozing out all the way around and wait for that to dry. This isn't a difficult project, but because of all the steps of gluing, it just takes a while to do. Okay, there's way too much wood to sit there and try to sand it all off. It would take forever. So I'm going to cut off as much as I can with a bandsaw. I have this special fence that I made. Notice how it comes in and down. And I have the blade inset here so that it'll cut without hitting this. So we'll cut off as much as we can without touching the box. And back at the belt sander, all I have to do is sand off the rest of it. Uh, another way you could do this is with a flush router bit. And you know that would work just as well. You'd still need to do some sanding though. Um, be careful when sanding a lot of wood, especially with birch or hard woods, um, and even more on the end grain. The sander will want to burn the wood. So what you want to do is make sure you don't stay in one spot for too long. Sand in different spots and that way you won't overheat the, the sandpaper and start burning the wood. You can also sand on one side for a little bit and rotate it and just keep cycling through all the sides so they don't burn. Next I'm going to router the bottom edge all the way around. Uh, whenever you're using the router, router the end grain first. Because as the router comes out, it'll splinter a lot of the wood. And then when you router the side grain, it'll hide most of the splinters that the uh, end grain made. Assembly done. I'm going to start sanding it. Start out with some rough, maybe 120 grit, and go to 150 and 220. And if you want to do some higher grits than that, that's fine. The higher you go, the more smooth of a surface you're going to get, and the better you're going to see the grain of the wood. I like to sand on top of a uh, piece of carpet because. Sometimes uh, little pieces of glue get on the, the work table and if you're pushing down with the sander on your project and there's any, anything on the table, it, it'll get embedded into the bottom of your box. So let's just make sure everything is kept nice. Basically I'm going to spend time sanding all the surfaces and then I'll round over the corners just slightly because I don't like it to be this sharp. But you don't want to round it too much because if, if you round it a lot like we did on the bottom, then you'll lose some of your 
play area. So just enough to remove the sharp corners, but not much more than that. Next we're going to cut off the top with a bandsaw. I'm going to set the fence up so that the blade's going to cut it off and leave about a half inch lip on there so we can attach the hinges. Make sure that you keep it against the fence and uh, decide where you want the hinges and wherever you want the hinges to be, put that against the blade. You want to cut slow for the first half inch and the last about half inch because you're cutting through the entire thickness of the box. You'll notice it's going to be a lot easier to cut after you get past the, that first little bit there. Okay, slow way down when you get to the end. You don't want to fall forward when that blade exits out the wood. Okay, so as you can see the blade left a couple of burnt marks here and there. Um, probably because the blade is getting a little dull. But uh, this is easy to fix. All you have to do is do the same step again here. Just Push down evenly, sand it back and forth until everything's nice and flat again. Okay, that step is done. As you can see, all the burn marks are removed. And I'm ready for the next step. Um, you should remove any of the any really sharp corners or splinters off. Don't do too much because you want to keep a nice crisp edge but not really sharp. Um, so just a couple strokes is all you really need off of each edge and that will make sure you're not going to get any splinters later on. Do that on the inside as well. Okay, next I'm going to put the hinges on. Uh, one of the most common mistakes is uh, people putting the lid on the wrong way. Um, make sure that the grain matches. I have lots of students accidentally you know, turn it because it's square and I'll put the, the, lid on, the lid on like this and they'll have end grain here and then end grain there and that just looks ugly. Or they'll even go 180 and you know it looks okay but the grain doesn't continue on. You want the grain to, to match and look as if it was made out of one piece of wood, which it is, so. All right, I like this side the best, so I'm gonna make that the front. Again, make sure the grain is matching. And this will be my back. So I'm gonna put 
put in the vise with the back side up. Okay, this is very important. You gotta make sure you get a just get a half sheet of scrap paper, fold it in half. And then fold it in half again. Just like that. What that does is it puts a gap, just a small one in the back, and that makes sure that it can close all the way down in the front. If you don't do this, it'll close in the back before the front and it might just not close all the way. And that won't be good if you're trying to play a game on the top of it. All right. Make sure that everything is perfectly lined up all the way around the box. This is one of the last things you're going to do. You want to make sure it's done right. So just feel your finger all the way around along where the, the lid and the bottom go together. And then slowly tighten up the vise. Make sure it feels good all the way around. Once you got it nice and tight and everything is steady, then it's time to place the hinges. Okay. I'm going to put one right here, another one right here. Basically, I'm just kind of continuing the checkerboard pattern with the hinge. I'm going to line up the corner of the hinge with the corner of that piece of lace wood, and then this one with the corner of the birch. And you can place the hinges wherever you want, just make sure they're even. Alright, the next step, you know, make sure it's in the exact right spot that you want it. And you use a scratch awl and poke right there in the center of the hole. Just put a little bit of a indent there. That'll make it so that there's a, a starting hole for the drill. So I'm going to pre-drill a small hole so that the screw can go into the wood, especially with birch and oak, they're very tough woods. If you go all the way through, that's okay, but I like to just go the depth of the screw. The screws that I'm using are going to be really small, so only about the size of the screw. Uh, one thing you can do is you can wrap a piece of tape around the drill bit so it can tell you when to stop. Okay, so I only did one hole, and I did that for a reason. I need to screw this one down and that will hold the hold the hinge in place while I do the other ones. Make sure you're pushing down while you're turning in the screw because these screws are really um, not that not that strong. You can strip out the, the head really easily. So make sure you're getting that screwdriver down into the grooves while you're turning it. Okay, now that that's t tight, a little bit more here. Okay, so it's tight. Now I can I can mess around with it and it won't move around as much. So now I can do the other three holes without worrying about it moving around. Make sure these marks are exactly in the center. And they, again, they help the drill so it doesn't wander. We'll make sure that the drill goes in the exact center of each of those. Okay, 
now I can do the other three screws and it should work perfectly. Do that to both hinges and you'll be good to go. Okay, the last screw is in. I'm ready to take it out. Take the piece of paper out. Again, that makes sure that the front closes down all the way because there's just a small gap in the back. Now it's time for finishing. You have a choice, you can just rub the whole thing down with oil, or we can put a, a coat of a coat or two or three of uh, lacquer on there. I don't recommend staining this project because you want the natural color of the wood to create the difference in colors. Staining it just, I think, makes it look worse. Okay, for la uh, lacquer, um, we use this gun here. Don't mess with the knobs. That's for me to set up. If you think it's not working right, let me know. Um, just so you know, only pulling the trigger halfway, it's just shooting air. You have to pull the trigger all the way back as far as it can go to make sure that lacquer is actually coming out. You can actually use the, that feature of pulling it just halfway to blow any dust off of your project. So I'll just do that really quick. Kinda blow it off a little bit. Make sure everything's good. Also, when you put the gun away, it hangs by the canister like that. I've had too many students try to hang it in other weird ways, so make sure it goes back the right way. All right. When I start out, I like to spray the top and the back and then I open it up carefully without touching that and then I do everything else. If you tried to do it like this to start out with you can't spray inside right here so that's why I do the at least the back first and then pop it up like this and do everything else. Okay, now um, two or three coats is usually what is recommended. You don't want to put too much on or it will start dripping and running. So make sure you don't put a whole lot of this stuff on there. Um, when you're spraying, start off of the project and then work your way across and then past. Don't start spraying in the middle of the project unless you're already moving. If you're not moving and you pull the trigger, it's too late, you just created a puddle. So, be, be moving the gun before you even pull the trigger and you want to be um, about five inches away from the project. Um, too far away doesn't give you enough spray and too close will give you a big ugly looking puddle again. So, five inches is perfect. Um, also, move the gun side to side while it's pointing straight at the project instead of rotating the wrist and moving the gun like this. Okay, so straight across, keeping the gun about five inches away from the project is the best way to do this. So I'll go ahead and turn on the, uh, the, the uh, fan here.
the top because it's flat than you do on the sides. The sides can drip and run, but the top, because it's flat, it's not going to drip off as bad. Okay, after you're done, you gotta be careful to pick it up the right way. Try not to get fingerprints on it. So pick it up from the bottom like that and then take it to the other room to dry so that other people can get in and use the same turntable. Okay, after the first coat dries, um, the next day uh, rub it down with steel wool to remove any uh, imperfections. Then do a second coat. The second coat will look a lot better. Uh, the first coat gets absorbed by the wood quite a bit, so do at least two coats, uh, three if you want it to be a little bit thicker. After that, you're pretty much done. Uh, other enhancements that you can do would be to line the inside with felt or paint the inside of it black somehow. Um, you know, it's up to you uh, what you want to do on the inside of the box.